What's going on, everybody? This is episode 105 of the Masterclass. My name is Cam, and I am joined for the 105th time by my good friend. High five. High five. Oh, that was terrible. That was a terrible high five. (laughs) Uh, Good thing the camera wasn't going. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Dave, what's up? Uh, You know, doing all right. So Uh, We totally whiffed. We're like... (laughs) Four feet apart and just, it's like all well, pinkies. I all think pinkies I whiffed. I'm not sure that you whiffed. Oh, well, I, I appreciate you for taking the fall on that one. But anyways, we're here. We're back. It's the master class. It's episode 105. And I think both of us are quite excited about this episode because we're going to continue our discussion from last episode where my sister was here and we talked about the Old Testament and Dave has some follow-up thoughts and um discussion points that he wants to hit on. So we don't have any follow-up. No. Which is not surprising. <laughs> it's sad, but it's not surprising. Um, so I'm just going to kind of send it into your court, Dave, and we're just going to roll with it. So okay. let's go Old Testament. Here we go. Well, I just, I guess I want to start by thanking Rachel for joining us and just acknowledging um, her, her um, just input and the wisdom that she brought to the show. And uh, I think she made a lot of valid points of just how important uh, the Old Testament is and that as Christians, um, it is certainly something that um, we need to embrace and certainly points towards Jesus and why he came. And I think she did a good job of articulating uh, the importance of the Old Testament and what it means to us. And I know at times I was being a little bit maybe glib about just uh, some of the stories that are uh, that are in there and um, how do we wrestle with those and how do we deal with those. And um, I, while I was tongue in cheek on a lot of the things that I said, I still think there is um, there's some practical application there, and there's a bit of truth in terms of. I think what we encounter as Christians when it comes to our faith, and then just even uh, the reality of uh, how do we treat the Old Testament and how do we view the Old Testament. And I, I guess my hunch is, my feeling is, is that a vast majority of us who would call ourselves Christians, maybe not a majority, a significant number of us who call ourselves Christians don't quite understand the importance of the Old Testament and um, my experience personally has been uh, the Old Testament seems to be what gets quoted uh, when non-believers, non-seekers, those who just really don't have an interest in uh, Christianity want to make an argument about how Christians do things, want to point out their hypocrisy, they tend to use the Old Testament a lot more than they do the New Testament. And um, I'm going to kind of just piggyback on a um, quote or a comment. I don't even know if this is real or not that I, I discovered on the old uh, that I discovered on the internet. Reference my um, looking at how we approach the Old Testament. And it, so I'm going to read it. It's pretty common these days for people to dismiss Christians as is inconsistent because they follow some of the rules in the Bible and ignore others. The challenge usually sounds something like this. When the Bible talks about certain, Christ, certain sexual behaviors as sin, you quote that. But then it says not to eat shellfish or that you should execute people for breaking the Sabbath. You just ignore it. Aren't you just picking and choosing what suits you best? And I, I, I don't know. Is that is that something you've encountered? Do you think that's a, a, a I'm not going to say a valid argument, but would you say that that is a, a common argument, or that's something that people tend to kind of throw out there? when they want to argue Christians and the inconsistency and point out the hypocrisy that they have in their faith. Yeah. So I think in my, in, in my experience, the, 
the quote isn't the same, but the idea of hypocrisy is there. Mm -hmm. It it may not be that the people know the Old Testament well enough to say X, Y, and Z, as you said. Um, Usually for me, it doesn't get that specific. It's Christians are hypocrites or Christians are stupid. Mm-hmm. And I kind of be like, I'm, I'm a okay. Christian. <laughs> I'm not stupid. I'm, I'm minorly hypocritical, you know? Um, so I've never had someone say to me, you know, when the Bible talks about certain sexual behaviors as sin, you quote that, <laughs> but what, you know, but I have had people say like, why, why do Christians hate homosexuals so much? I've I've had someone like we I work at a coffee shop and I work with Christians and I work with non Christians and in in that mix, I mean there's there's Catholics there's Protestants and then you get more specific there's Baptists there's non denominational non denominationals there's people that are Christians but don't go to church because they're just fed up with church they love God they love the Bible but church is like I'm done mm-hmm. like there and then there's people that are like ah I'm open to talking about it. And there's other people that are like, yeah, let's just serve coffee. So like, it's, it's a pretty good mix. <laughs> and, you know, even in, in that, I've never had someone say, when the Bible talks about certain sexual behaviors of sin, you quote that. Like, it's, it's never that specific. It's more on the, does God exist? Is Christianity, or any religion for that matter, be it Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, like whatever the ism it might be, is that legit? And then how does that how does that interact with a, you know, young twenty something trying to figure out what he or she wants to do with their life? And so I mean I I guess I guess I just I mean, we've I've had the homosexual talk with people and and the often the the thing that I often get is well I'm I'm homosexual or I know someone who is and the bible tells me that I'm wrong and that's just not okay. And my response is well guess what the bible tells me as a heterosexual man married to a woman with a child. The bible tells me I'm wrong as well. Right. For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And 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 to me that is that is my attempt be it be it good or bad or whatever, is my attempt to try and make common ground with the person who feels like Christianity or the Bible or Christians or the church in general are anti-homosexual, which, if you just take a look at the news, is absolutely true. But if you know someone who is a Christian... It's not that they're anti-homosexual, hopefully. If they are, they're misunderstanding the spirit behind the law, right? And hopefully we'll get into this in our talk of the Old Testament. Is that, yeah. Do I think that homosexuality is a sin? Yes. Do I think the fact that I would have sex with 30 different women is a sin? Yeah. Right. Does does that make me... Un, unlovable or like I don't I don't and and maybe it's because of the political and the cultural narrative behind the whole homosexuality and equal rights movement in this country over the last 40 years that that draws so much emotional and um political ire is that as a man who is attracted to women very much so that's okay. And it has always been okay. To the point where it was like super sketchy for a long time to be okay. You know what I mean? But as a, if a dude is attracted to another man, for the longest time, that was totally unacceptable and was, you know, not, and wasn't, wasn't okay. And, and so we're coming, we're coming at the same issue, I think, from very different trajectories of, my sexual desires are not okay in the eyes of God. But in the eyes of man, my personal desires to be with women 
is, well, it's not illegal, it's just probably not very moral. Whereas the other side, you know, if I'm attracted to men, is it was not necessarily illegal, but it wasn't legal, it wasn't broadly accepted, but it was also had that moral, you know, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I, I'm never short on words, Dave. Uh, <laughs> taboo about it. And now we're, we're in a state in, in 2017 where it is legal and the moral taboo is, is quickly going away. Now, this is after decades and decades of it being really, 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 really taboo and the conservative Christian consortium of people rallying against it. But so when I, when I just, my, my view on this whole sexual thing is, does the Bible say that homosexuality is wrong? Yes. But it also says that sex before marriage Sex with someone you're not married to while you're married is wrong, and sex before you're married is wrong. And the fact that one has been elevated above the others, for whatever reason, is a problem. And so when, when I would talk to someone who is homosexual, and I have done this, says that the Bible tells me I'm wrong because I like other men, I tell them, the Bible tells me I'm wrong because I like women that are not my wife. Right. And by like, we mean sexual attraction. Right. And the thoughts and the visions that go along with such feelings. And I just, I, I, what I don't understand, and this is kind of where I'm going to lean on you here, Dave, is, is why do we think that how we feel and what makes us happy is innately correct. Like, why do, we, why do we assume that because I feel this way, it must be the right way of living? Like, that, that, that screams hubris to me. Mm-hmm. Why, because I feel this way, do I assume that it is the right way to live? And if you tell me I'm wrong, you're wrong and I'm right. And this goes beyond sexual feelings. This mm-hmm. goes to... How I how I run my money, how I run my family, how I you know seek happiness. Well, I I, I think that's what we have crammed down our throat is this idea of well, if it makes you happy, do it. Follow your dreams, follow your heart. I mean, any movie that you would go to these days basically is all about following your dreams and following your heart. Which, and and to be fair, like following your dreams is in a, you know something to aspire to. You know, no one, no one wants to just say, work an endless nine-to-five job the rest of your life and be happy. But how many of us do that? Right. And, and I think that there is, like, there's this whole debate of are we born homosexual or are we born heterosexual? And that's just who we are and there's nothing we can do about it. Or is there choice in the matter? And I feel like that's the wrong question to ask. Sure. Because I, what I don't think is I feel like that is a cop-out either way. Either you are born that way or you're not born that way. If, to me, that's a cop-out of you don't want to deal with how you are now. Because how you are now is a choice. I'm heterosexual. My wife is a very pretty woman. Like, scientifically, she's attractive. <laughs> she got, she's a good-looking woman. But that does not stop me from having feelings of, wow, she's pretty and she's pretty. And even though I know that I cannot follow those feelings towards, you know, the end that perhaps my body would wish. Right. And those thoughts of being attracted to other women that are not my wife are sinful thoughts because I am married to my wife for life, forever. But if I have those thoughts about my wife, Totally cool, right? I should be attracted to my wife. I really hope she doesn't listen to this episode. <laughs> you know? Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to say in a really roundabout way is that 
um, if we step back from something that's such a hot topic as homosexuality in America right now, and and is it legal to marry you know a man to a man or a woman to a woman, and and how the church handles that, and and step back to something that's a little less um, heated of an argument in the Bible, such as you know what do we eat, what do we wear, uh, how do we handle conflict things that are a little less politically charged, um, which the Old Testament addresses all of those things, uh, you know, perhaps we can begin to enter into a discussion of what the Bible says, what Christians believe, in an, in an arena that is a little less volatile than what you do in your bedroom. Mm-hmm. You know, and so like we bring up we bring up the sex thing because that is obviously one of the the major themes of the political realm that we live in over the past few years is the legalization uh, of homosexual marriage. And, you know, that obviously brings up discussions. But if we're going to take the Old Testament and the New Testament as a whole, we have to realize that like sex is a very, very, very small sliver of your life. Whether you're heterosexual, homosexual, or bisexual, it is a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of what you do for the majority of your life. And so I I would like to... uh, kind of preface the Old Testament discussion with that, but also say, like, there's a lot more to talk about than just that. So what are you thinking right now, Dave? Where should we go with this conversation? Well, a, a, a couple of different thoughts. Um, I think, one, as if you consider yourself a Christian, you, follow, you consider yourself a follower of Christ, you should you should take some time and look at the Old Testament and really make an effort to um, understand to a certain degree why the Old Testament exists. And I think, again, Rachel did a great job of doing that last week in terms of, you know, the law points us towards Jesus and it points us towards the need of salvation. Uh, Then I think there's this second piece of um, particularly in the day and age that we live in, of people kind of wanting to point out the hypocrisy, people wanting to point out that, well, you believe this, but you don't believe that. And I certainly think as Christians, we should go, well, what is it that I believe that has changed because of the Old Testament or, or changed since the Old Testament? And what is it that I believe that is still in line and consistent with the Old Testament? And, uh, when I brought up this this particular topic and this issue, homosexuality was not something I thought we would spend a lot of time on, but it's interesting that that's what you brought up because that is, for me personally, the context of kind of this, um, what I've experienced when talking with people about faith and what we believe in Christians, all that kind of stuff, and them pointing out to me of, will you pick and choose what to believe? And homosexuality is kind of that argument or the context where a lot of that will happen because uh, they'll also bring up the idea of, um, well, you know, people in the Old Testament had multiple wives and we don't do that anymore. And, you know, X, Y, you know, those sorts of things. And um, so I don't think we should get completely caught up in the idea when somebody starts going, Oh, you Christians, you're hypocrites. You pick and choose what the Bible says. Because that person is always going to find an argument to not believe. And as you said, we're talking about sin in the the broader scope versus sins in the individual because we all have individual sins. Um and so when you encounter that person who says, well, you're a hypocrite, or the, the Bible, you know, doesn't like me, or Jesus doesn't like me because I'm homosexual, I think your answer is very valid. Well, it says the same thing about me. It says it's that... It's the only answer. It is the only answer. And I think you're absolutely right, because to be quite candid, and I've, and I've said this to my wife before, and it's, 
it's embarrassing to be this way, but it is the truth about who I am. I feel like I am wired to have sex with as many people as I can, or many women <laughs> as I possibly can. Nothing against you guys. I'm not wired that way, but I, I'm wired to have sex with as many women as I possibly can. I was born that way. I, I've been that way at least for the last 30, 35 years. But I choose, I make a conscious effort to say, I'm going to love my wife and I'm only going to be intimate with my wife. It doesn't mean I don't struggle with lust. It doesn't mean I don't struggle with things that I can see on the internet. It doesn't mean I don't struggle with things that I can see on my television. It doesn't mean that it's not a battle for me to choose purity, to choose God, to choose what he designed for me. And I think that's even in all of this about what we're talking about. And as I mentioned last week, I'm kind of trying to get a bigger uh, picture of of the Old Testament by reading through it without getting too caught up in the minutia of God desires what is best for us. It's not he put those things out there to make life no fun, and it's not that he put these things out there to make our lives miserable. It's he knows what is best for us, and so he chooses, or he desires for us to choose what is best versus um, well, kind of these the impulses we have the impulses that we well have. and uh, like let's be honest you know if God wanted us not to have fun then we wouldn't have sex to make babies yeah it, sex was his idea and high five to him for that <laughs> yeah but like okay so here's the Here's the thing I don't understand. And if you are listening to the show and you are a homosexual, please, please, please write in and explain this to Dave and I. Why? What is the difference between you desiring someone of the same sex and us desiring someone of the opposite sex who is not our spouse? Like, is there a fundamental difference there, or is there not? Because what the Bible tells us is that sex is meant for a man and a woman that have entered into the covenant of marriage. That does not that does not mean that there is not desire outside of that, but it means that your actions are only inside of that. And I feel like we've been like super heavy on the sex stuff this episode, which is, you know, it's fine. It's life. That's what people do. Um, but it's, it's something hard for people to understand the viewpoints of others without really honest conversation. So if if you're out there and you're listening and you are a homosexual and you want to inform us as to what you think the difference is between that, that'd be really helpful to us because then we could speak more accurately to to what we know and what, what we believe the Bible says and and really not you know intentionally at all cast judgment upon you but just try and 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 speak to the facts. Um so I don't know, Dave, is there is there anything else that you want to say on this topic before we move on? I don't want to cut you off. Uh, so in terms of um, the sexuality, uh, King David in the Old Testament is considered a man after God's own And he heart. liked him some naked women. He did like him some naked women. And specifically in 2 Samuel, so 2 Samuel 11, um, it talks about, um, well, we'll start with verse 2. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. Then he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, It is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So, she's got a husband. Not only does she have a husband, the husband is a soldier in David, King David's army. Long story short, King David has sex with Bathsheba. He gets her pregnant, and then he has Uriah, her husband, 
killed by basically putting him in a situation where... After multiple attempts to have him go home and consummate the marriage with his wife. Yes. And he refuses because he is a man of honor and wants to be, you know, have solidarity with his soldiers. Yeah. And so Jesus is, or Jesus, (laughs) King David is very much, uh, it sounds like a duck. It quacks like a duck, but I'm in Sunday school. So I'm going to say Jesus. Um, (laughs) it, it truly is one of those moments of like, I remember being a youth pastor. It was like, I literally had kids say, uh, Jesus, to the answer of a question that had nothing to do with Jesus, but because we were in church. It's a good guess. That was always the safe answer. So, King David, man after God's own heart, a sinner, someone that gets caught up in his sin of desiring a woman who's not his wife, well, maybe even worse than not being his wife. She is, com- she is another man's wife. Um. You know, we're talking about sin here, and sin is sin. Uh, It's not about, you know, the degree of sin that you've committed and what level you're on. But the reality is, is that Bathsheba is actually in Jesus' genealogy. And King David is kind of like, you know, yes, you will be, uh, you know, the throne of David and uh, the prophecy in terms of Jesus and all that kind of stuff. And if we take a look at Matthew 1, verses 6, ver- wow, Matthew 1, verse 6, <laughs> it says, And Jesse, the father of David, the king... And David was the father of Solomon, Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of, you know, so it goes on down the road. So I guess my point being is we serve a big God, which I know we have said, I have said many times on this podcast, to the point that David committing adultery and getting a married, married woman pregnant and then having her husband killed it is still then listed in the book of Matthew as part of Jesus' genealogy. And it just, it doesn't just say, you know, Jesse had David, David had Solomon. You know, we could have skipped over that because by Hebrew tradition, yeah, hide the transgression, just, yeah. Get it could have been very easy just mm-hmm. to name who the dads were. But no, it says Solomon related to Bathsheba. And oh, by the way, Bathsheba was Uriah's wife. And if we go back and we look in the Old Testament, we see what that means. So if I can kind of just sum up in all of this, Christianity is not about always doing the right thing. It is not always about believing the right thing. It is not always about, it's never about, well, maybe it's never. Maybe not never. The bigger, the bigger, the bigger issue is being saved by God's grace. These things that we should do are because God, like I said earlier, God wants what is best for us. But we serve a big and awesome God who is willing to redeem our sin to the point that even an adulterous relationship that ends in pregnancy gets listed in the genealogy of our Messiah. And so to get hung up on little things like, well, why do you choose to follow this? Why do you choose to not follow this? Why is this is really kind of somebody that wants to make an argument for argument's sake. If you encounter a person who is that biblical savvy, you are already down the road to being able to share the gospel with that person, and you should embrace that opportunity. And as a believer, I don't think we should be caught off guard by these arguments. We should be prepared for them. And in terms of what it talks about in terms of, well, why do you not eat shellfish and those sorts of things? Well, Peter in the book of Acts 
has a vision of a, a sheet being lowered down where God tells him to eat. And there's all kinds of different animals. And Peter responds, surely not, Lord. I won't do that. And the sheet gets lowered down again. And it's like, you know, eat. This stuff is clean. This doesn't matter. The old law is gone away. And so um, I guess where I feel like this is is that when people want to point out the hypocrisy, yeah, there is hypocrisy. There's sin everywhere. The, it's everywhere. And it's just like, I, I think Cam's answer early on in this podcast was exactly what we were trying to get to in that we all fall short of the glory of God. We all need a Messiah. We all need a Savior. And we need to acknowledge him because that is the only way that any of us are worthy of heaven. That is why any of us are worthy of being in the presence of God. And so, um, know your Old Testament, be familiar with that, but don't get hung up on those kinds of little small things. Because, yeah, there were a, a lot of pieces that don't apply to us today. And if you take a look at the New Testament, a lot of those things that, uh, you know, it, it appears that we're pick and choosing. It really is kind of specific about, well, this is what you need to be. Um, you know, when it talks about the requirements of an elder, it talks about being the husband of one wife. Um, in the Old Testament, clearly having multiple wives was okay. But in the New Testament with Paul, he says, no. We really need to, we need to have one, one wife. Divorce is not okay. You know, Jesus tells that uh, in the Gospels. So it's really not about picking and choosing. It's about what applies to us and why does it apply to us. And, you know, one of the analogies that I've kind of come across that for me personally worked quite well is that, um, you know, we live in the United States of America. There's states' rights and there's federal law. And not to get too terribly complicated, but there's kind of this idea of murder is not legal in any of the 50 states. So just because it's illegal in California doesn't mean it's illegal in Kansas. If I were to commit murder, I would not be tried by California law. I would be tried by Kansas law. Now, just because California law doesn't apply to me and where I'm at in Kansas doesn't mean that murder is ever acceptable. There's this, um, and I don't even know if I'm making <laughs> the point that I want to make in this, of just that there are different laws for different times in different places, but there are some things that just transcend time and place, and we need to not get so hung up over, well, that was 2,000 years ago, that was the Old Testament. There are basic truths that uh, God intends for us that make our lives better. And I've, I've rambled on long enough. So. No, you're good. <laughs> I just... I think it's... To kind of roll back to the, the front of this episode, I think it's fair to ask as a Christian, what is the fundamental difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that is something that needs to be addressed, uh, whether you know it be uh, via podcast or hopefully church sermons, or you know Bible studies or whatnot, um, to understand exactly because you run into Christians that, um, and this is not to to sound elitist or anything; they just don't have the education we do. Like we were both in ministry mm -hmm. for years mm -hmm. and we have the education to, to back that up, but that is not what, you know, your normal person has. And I just, I just wonder what are we doing as modern Christians in churches to encourage and teach the holistic 
idea of the Bible? What, what, are we, what are we teaching that is minimizing the Old Testament? What are we teaching that is neglecting the Old Testament? And what are we teaching that is wrong about the Old Testament? And, you know, you, you often talk to Christians and they're like, oh, what are your favorite, you know, books of the Bible? And their top 27 are New Testament books. <laughs> and you're like, there are 66 other books in the Bible. 39 other. Whatever. I don't know. <laughs> See, that's my point. I said it and I was like, that is not right. That's 66 way too- total, 39 yeah, and 27. 20, 27 and 39, yes. See, oh, I, had, I had the number right, just the wrong allocation. But that proves my point. Is that in today's modern American kind of you know, view of Christianity, it is rare. It's not, it is not uh, unfounded, but it is rare that the Old Testament has a play, an equal place at the table. And I think that we suffer, you know, because so many people will say homosexuality is wrong because it says so in the Old Testament. Where does it say that? I don't know. It's somewhere in there. Right. Or uh, it is, you know, it's wrong to do X. Or this is why you can't eat pork. And, uh, and, and here's what I really think. Here's what I think about the Bible in total. Nuance. Is that it is incredibly important to view the Bible... Those were Dave's headphones, by the way. (laughs) It is incredibly important to read and understand. Can you not do that by your microphone? (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) To read the Bible with a nuance. It is not. Ecclesiastes is not the same as Luke. James is not the same as uh, Hezekiah. And Genesis is not the same as Revelation. Each of these books of the Bible are written in a certain genre with a certain point. And while it is difficult to interpret them in some circumstances, it is not insane to recognize the differences therein. And yes, while there are certain portions of the Bible that are much trickier than others, and this whole homosexuality versus transgender versus heterosexuality, like that's the current like political issue. And we live in a country where we claim we, you know, uh, enjoy religious freedom. But if you think, you know, that, that the transgenderism is wrong, you're cast into this, you know, corner of, you know, you're not open-minded or or whatever. And, and we don't need to get into that necessarily this episode, but the point is that the entire Bible should be open for discussion. And as Christians, we need to be competent when it comes to the Old Testament because it is just as important as the New Testament, because when you look at the Old Testament, you see the character of God, you see the judgment of God, you see the mercy of God, you see the entire narrative that leads up to the point where Jesus shows up. Mm -hmm. And if Jesus just showed up with no warning, like just straight up, just like, hey, I'm Jesus, I'm here, woo, and everyone would be like, what do you freaking do, man? You're like, there's no importance to you. But because of the Old Testament, because of the law, because of the history with the Jewish people, Jesus actually mattered. And in hindsight, Jesus actually matters because he fulfills everything that God set set out. Mm -hmm. He satisfies the wrath. He satisfies the law. He satisfies the mercy. He satisfies the judgment. And he even satisfies the grace of God. But without the Old Testament, starting off with, ah, here's my kid, I'm going to kill him. Like, 
you need some background for that. <laughs> yes. In order for it to be like, oh, that's still terrifying and still terrible and still awful. But there's some context here. Right. You don't have to start off with like, and kill the kid. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So I guess to, to Christians or curious folk or atheists or agnostics that are like, yeah, the Old Testament. Uh, read it again. That's, that's my advice. Or write in, you know, to the show at hello at supermegacorp.net and tell us why we're wrong. We like contrarians. <laughs> I'm a contrarian. Even though I say it with like an extra still contrarian. So yeah, hello at supermegacorp.net. You can get the show notes at supermegacorp.net slash masterclass slash 105. And you'll find links to our Twitters there, David J. Hogue and Cam Brennan. Um, any other thoughts? Dawid? That's Hebrew for David. <laughs> um, no, I, I just would encourage folks to, to, to read the Old Testament and um, be familiar with it, know it, understand why. Uh, Jesus was the fulfillment of of the of the law, and then ultimately, when you encounter those folks who want to say, "Well, you pick and choose what to believe and what to follow," that's actually probably a good sign that you've encountered somebody that has thought about this, that is wrestling with this, and that you, as a Christian, need to be ready with your answer for why you believe what you believe. And that you don't just dismiss it, uh, but actually embrace kind of the idea of somebody throwing things at you and using Scripture as an opportunity to really uh, share the gospel and share your your witness, your testimony of how you became who you are and why you're where you're at in your walk with Jesus. Agreed. Sounds good. All right. Well, until next time. This has been the Masterclass. Episode 105. 105, yeah. And we'll be back very soon. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.